You're listening to Parasearch UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to Seventh Sanctum with Kerry Ann, only on Parasearch UK Radio. Welcome. This is Seventh Sanctum uh, on Parasearch UK Radio, and I am Kerry Ann. And thank you so much for joining me this evening. If you have, you're in for a bit of a treat. Um, I'm being joined tonight with um, Kerry Greenway. Say hello, Kerry. I'm good, thank you. Super excited for tonight. Yeah, good, very, excited. very excited about tonight. It's going to be a good one. Yes, so tonight we have a special guest. We have Alison Dunlop. Thank you so much for joining us, Alice. Alison. Thank you for asking me. No, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you've. Um, we've been talking a little while for you to come along onto the show, and I'm so glad that we've been able to put a date down. I'm really excited to talk about all the things that we've got coming up in the show. So, have you had a good week? Sorry, you say that again. Have you had a good, sorry, have you had a good week? I have had a good, sorry, I didn't hear that there. I have had a good week, yes. Um, it's been quite, uh, I've been reading a lot for, uh, I'm doing a course just now. at. I'm doing my master's part-time at Glasgow University. So I've been doing quite a lot of reading for that. And uh, yeah, it's been a good week. Brilliant. Well, that, that is really fascinating within itself. Um I managed to um, cross paths with you actually. Uh, in your show was the first thing that I actually come across. The um, ADX uh, files was mm-hmm. the first time I've ever come across yourself, um, <clears throat> and I was really intrigued by some of the topics and things you were talking about at the time. You had a reverend on the show. I think he was talking about um, UFOs, and uh, and that's when I kind of was like, I really would love to speak to this lady. <laughs> um, so. My first question, I have loads. I'm just waiting for you to throw them all at you. Um, but my first question for you, I would love to know how your journey began. How did you ever really come onto this path? Um, well, I've, I've always, I suppose, had an interest in the subject from an early age. Um, there was a few um, sort of more minor experiences that I had, but then I, I suppose my major experience was um, when I had the incubus attack Uh, so that propelled me into looking at things uh, a bit more in that direction but um, prior to that uh, I had there was a few things um, like seeing an angel when I was ill when I was on dialysis um, and having precognitive feelings at that point rather than visions. So it kind of come on quite slowly. Uh, I did have one experience of sleep paralysis and almost an out-of-body experience that happened after a friend died. But I would say that the incubus attack was, was the main thing uh, that that um, got me into... Uh, investigating things more oh so that sounds like a really interesting experience or or scary experience Um, it was terrifying it really was could you would you like to you know explain more what that what happened there sure um so for listeners who don't know what an incubus is uh, it's the the male 
is the incubus of females is succubus so you might have heard it by that name as well and it's a demon that's reported to come to people in the middle of the night usually uh, during sleep paralysis um and this one now people have all different experiences of incubus and succubus uh, some are sexual, some are uh, physical assaults um, and things like that. Mine was more of a physical assault. Uh, so I woke up in the middle of the night. The room was a very strange shade of blue uh, and it felt strange and I felt I'd been dreaming about vampires and it it just felt kind of creepy and I turned around to waken my partner and I mean, I actually was turned around to waken him and uh, I couldn't get him awake, which is a feature of this experience. People who um, can't get their partners awake. And um, I was then flipped over onto my back by this uh, being. And um, so it was this very creepy male demonic very chalky white face, dark eyes, um, and very sort of leering lips, leering mouth. And uh, he was pinning me down and saying to me, you thought you could get away from me. Um, you thought you could get away from me, didn't you? And he was trying to scrape at my neck with this one long fingernail, trying to cut my throat. In the corner is another feature of the incubus attack. Um, is the was the old hag and she was standing in the corner, and she was laughing at all this. She was sort of scraggly, long, sort of scraggly grey hair, white nightdress, um, and covering her mouth. You know, this was very funny to her. Um, and at some point, then um, I mean, I was trying to force my head back into the pillow, wondering what on earth was going on. And uh, at, at some point, I'm, I guess, I must have passed out, but I woke in the morning uh, and everything was back to normal. About a week later, I started having this feeling again. Uh, I left out the part where I was paralysed, um, so I couldn't move at all. So I was completely, you know, you're completely vulnerable. Um, I woke up about a week later with the same light in my room, paralysed. My partner was actually through the room and it, it was just like I was just going into the experience. And so I was able to scream out and he came through and put the light on. Um, although then you might ask, well, if he was awake and heard me, why when he was asleep could I not waken him? I don't know. That's maybe something to think about. Um, about, uh, I don't know, maybe about a year later or or, or something like that, uh, I was coming um, past the, the woman across the landing from me. Um, I was coming past her door. Uh, and I lived in the 15th floor at the time, I should say. And her window was wide open um, and the curtains were blown about. Her door was wide open and I could hear her speaking in this, what I could only describe as a demonic voice. Uh, and she was saying all sorts of things, which I won't repeat, but it was very concerning. It, it did not sound like a human voice. I, I said to the concierge, I was very concerned and they said, we're concerned too. Um, we've contacted social services and um, shortly afterwards social services did come and take her to a psychiatric unit. Um, the two things are very, very closely linked. This, um, you know, the association of the demonic with uh, the person's psychology and psychiatry. Um, so that that was something else. But what was it, something like 14 years later? I can't remember now, 16 years later. Um, I No, it was 14 years later. I met someone called James Welsh at the uh, conference in, there was a conference in Stirling, uh, a paranormal 
Paranormal Festival, I beg your pardon, it was the Paranormal Festival. And uh, so I met him and he was telling me about his sightings, his UFO sightings. And he, um, on the road back one night, because he lived in Glasgow too and we were coming back together on the bus, and uh, sorry, on the train, and he leaned forward and he said, I, I thought I would show you uh, this is kind of like what I saw. Uh, I've put it into a picture of the area that I saw it. And he leaned across and he showed me this picture. Now, he, he said that that's not the UFO. I didn't manage to get a picture of it, but that I put that in to show you where it where it was. And when he passed the picture over, it was right above my flat uh, where I had been living at the time uh, when I had that incubus experience. And when, so, I, you know, the blood just, I think, drained out my face. And uh, I said, and when was it you had these sightings again and it was the same month as I had had that experience so I had never um, not for one minute thought about um, the possibility of um, a crossover between what I saw as demonic and what um you know, UFOs are more associated with aliens. Um, So I had never associated what I felt, what I experienced to have visited me that night uh, as anything alien. And I, I carefully word that as experienced that visit because I don't claim it to be anything. I don't know what it was. I don't know how it works. I don't know why people have very, very similar experiences to it. But there, there are three main characters uh, that people experience, and this has been experienced back into Mesopotamian times. Uh, it was, I think, first written down in uh, Gilgamesh. Um, and uh, yeah, so you've got the old hag who I saw, you've got the male or female, young male or female demon. And you've got this sort of little troll-like figure. Now, on one occasion, because it was a very strange flat, and I don't know why that was, whether it was um, the because I was in the 15th floor, it might have something to do with altitude. It's not really that high, but you just don't know how things work, whether it might have something to do with pollution in the area or whatever. So I, I don't try to I try not to make a judgment on what it was or what it wasn't. Um but the troll like creature I saw outside my bedroom window one night um, shortly after hearing uh, that uh, the the neighbor speaking like that. Um and it couldn't see me. It was looking in. Um, it was sort of clinging to the outside of the window, 15 floors up, and it was looking in and looking all around the room, but it didn't seem to see me. Um, and this was the first time that I started doing mantras. I will associate mantras with uh, uh, Hin- Hinduism, Hindu philosophy, um, but you can ju- you can just as well say it in English. And uh, I started repeating, you're not real, you're not real, you're not real. And eventually I passed out, woke up and everything was normal again. Um, and these mantras have come to me spontaneously through, very, um, through various experiences. And sometimes... It's it's English and sometimes it's just a phrase of um, one of the um, one of the yogic uh, mantras, but I maybe don't actually understand what it means. But the mantra comes to me, and then I go and look it up and think, oh, that that's that was perfect for what I was doing there. Um, so I don't know. We don't know how the consciousness works, but you know, works in mysterious ways, as as they say. So that was the. Um, that was the incubus experience, anyway. Do you think there was a link between um, the UFO alleged that was uh, uh, over the flat at the time? Do you think it was just a trigger for a subconscious, on a subconscious level, for you to have these experiences, or do you think it was actually to do with the actual alien 
aliens themselves. Yeah, I really don't know. I really don't. Um, it, but it's been suggested that's one theory is that uh, it might have triggered off whatever the whatever it was might have triggered off an experience for me to uh, see. It might have, um, I guess, opened my third eye. Mm -hmm. uh, this shade of blue in the room is often associated with the third eye, which is uh, um, the, the chakras have similar uh, colours. So the mm -hmm. third eye chakra has a similar colour to that sort of bluish, purplish shade. Yeah, it's like indigo, uh, isn't and, it, the third eye? Yeah. Yeah, and so it may be that I was seeing, maybe that is what that is, that filter. Maybe it acts like, a, a, maybe that's um, the kind of light that we can see these beings in. Now, one um, new, uh, quite new, but uh, progress in looking for UFOs is to look at them through, um, I think, is a, uh, is a, mm, what kind of light again now? Uh, is it UV light? Ultraviolet light? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I can't remember now, but th looking at them through a certain filter, you're able to see more of them and more clearly. Uh, and this is just by using, I'm talking about using cameras, videos right. to do that. So it may be that there is something to do with colour that affects our perception. And that's a big possibility. Talking yeah. about the um, violet and the blue, we've spoken about um, Re we've spoken to Reverend John Polk before, and he mentioned something to do with the violet flame. Now, is this similar to what you're talking about? I, I've not heard of the violent fl uh, violet flame. Um, I don't know what that is. Can, that's usually linked that? to sorry. That's usually linked in. Um, which you might know a little bit more about, which is a, a, the Archangel Michael. And it's, ah. it's about pulling that energy in and using that violet vibration to work on that psychic level, but using that sort of energy, the angel energy with that, it, un, under my understanding. I could be wrong on that, but that's my understanding right. of it. But he's right. talking about the violet flame. And um, that in itself is an incredibly powerful tool to use in healing work. Um, that's where he uh, was coming from on that because he's um, also a Reiki master. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, that's what he was talking about. With yeah, that. That, well, that makes a lot of sense then. Um, the We talk about the, the blue cloak of Archangel Michael as uh, protecting us or um, imagining a blue bubble around us protecting us and, and calling upon Archangel Michael. Um, there's, there was possibly elements of that experience well, obviously, it was quite, uh, it was frightening. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, and it was frightening on a very, um, a very basic root, uh, primal sort of level. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 I think that, that that's one thing that I noticed when I did some research, was that people who had experienced what I had experienced, uh, there was something going on with the dynamics in their relationship with the other person. They were perhaps in a troubled relationship or a, a power struggle of some kind. Uh, and I don't know if that perhaps might connect to Archangel Michael as um, being an angel that gives you uh, courage and strength. Mm -hmm. So although and this was an argument I made at the the conference last year when I gave my, do my talk on uh, demons, demons in dark places, it's called, it's on YouTube. Uh, and, and this was one of my arguments that perhaps the incubus, although very, very frightening, not very nice, very draining as well, but perhaps it's a warning of some kind because in ancient times, these beings um, had a dual purpose. Uh, so they, they had the purpose of um, uh, being terrifying to pe people and not wanted, but they also, there was an element of protection. So people would uh, have statues of demons 
Uh, one in particular that comes to mind is Pazuzu from the film The Exorcist. Um, Pazuzu uh, embodied this dreaded pestilence that came in the, the winds. Um, and the statues of Pazuzu were also um, put on uh, windowsills and above doors and things like that, facing um, in the direction of the, the coming wind um, because he was deemed to be powerful enough to um, stop uh, any other diseases from uh, coming to you. So he was actually used as a protection as well as being something that was feared. So, yeah, that might all... You make these sort of, uh, connections between all these different things. Yeah. That's one thing I've noticed is there is a lot of crossover connections um, and I'm not half as knowledgeable as you, I would love to be, but um, when you start looking at you know various religions and stuff like that, there's so many crossovers, it's untrue. Um, sometimes they're called different things, but when you actually read what it's all about, then you, you go, hang on, I read that about that in another context and it's basically exactly the same thing, but it's just worded differently and named under Absolutely. a different banner. Absolutely. And this is actually part of my own research, my academic research, I mean, is the crossovers between uh, angels and ancient gods, but not just ancient gods, also uh, our modern concept of E.T. And what I've started looking at, the pattern that I've started seeing is um, between the ancient gods, because in uh, ancient times, for example, in ancient Greece. Uh, I'm just saying that because I'm a classicist. Um, in ancient Greece, the, you know, the, it was a polytheistic society, so you did have, like, one Zeus, god of the gods, um, but then you had, it was, it was a hierarchy, so there were other gods underneath Zeus. And what I'm thinking is that those uh, gods of the Olympians... Uh, who were underneath Zeus may be equated to the archangels. Uh, you've got uh, Ares, the god of war, who might equate to um, Michael. Uh, you've got Hermes, the messenger god, who might equate to uh, Gabriel. So that that was the point that I was at. That was actually triggered by another experience, uh, which makes me think that there's possibly a connection between our modern idea of um, these uh, Nordic or Pleiadian beings that, that, you know, space brothers that have come to the planet. People talk about having experienced them coming to the planet, giving messages of um, hope and health um, and and things like that. Um, my, Do you want to hear about my experience meeting the Pleiadians? Yes. Please. Okay, um, so I was, again, all these happen when I'm just coming out of a sleep. Uh, so a lot of people are psychologists, but um, I think it's, it's either hypnagogic or hypnopompic. I can't, I can never remember which way around it is. One is when you're going into sleep and one's when you're coming out of a sleep. So that would be the psychological um viewpoint for that but I'm very interested to know why people experience similar things so I woke up and there was a circle above me in the ceiling overhead it was going into another dimension and it looked kind of uh, spacey to me so it looked kind of like it might be uh, them looking over down well there was one man looking down over this platform he had dark hair, he had black hair and as soon as he saw me looking up he quickly said to someone that I couldn't see we've got her and then these other beings came over and looked down and one of them absolutely imploring to me said you have to tell people about us um, now, at this point, I was actually being lifted off the pillow by my shoulders and my head were off the pillow, um, and but I couldn't move other than that. And uh, so again, although I sensed that they 
did, they were not um, meaning to scare me, but nevertheless, it, it was when these things happen. It's it's extraordinary. It's like nothing. Um, it's like you're completely removed from the normal uh, that you you know that you would be in, and so it is terrifying. Um, and so when he said this, I said, I, I will, of course. And he said, no, you must promise that you'll tell people about us. And I said, OK, I promise. Uh, now, what brought me out of that was I became aware of this noise in the background um, and this movement in the background. And what it was when I started um, being pulled in the other direction away from this experience uh, what I realised it was was my cat Gandalf was going nuts he was going absolutely off his head He was I've never seen him in such a state um, and as I come out of this and my head sort of bounced back onto the pillow and I turned around he was howling he was pacing back and forward he was jumping up and down in the bed You know, he just was absolutely frantic. Uh, I mean, I could tell he was he was absolutely fraught with whatever he was seeing or whatever he was sensing, um, and I I don't know what that might be. But um, when I looked more into uh, this experience, because it was different, the, the, another aspect of it was there was a light between my forehead. And this circle going into this circle. So it was almost like a cone shape, if you can imagine that. Um, and when I look, I, one of the um, one of the main things that clicked was when I saw uh, Renaissance paintings of the Annunciation with the light going to Mary's forehead, the the circle of light in the uh, in the sky above. Um, and either uh, Gabriel, the the messenger angel, or the the dove, which symbolised the the messenger. Um, uh, so that was that was the first step for me to thinking. Um, okay, I actually couldn't tell, although they were quite spacey. You know, it was um, a lot of people have experienced them as either Pleiadians or dark haired. Well, it was dark haired Nordics. Um, uh, more sort of dressed like in the sort of Star trek type, you know, uh, clothes. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I started making connections between the, uh, these beings and because I couldn't really distinguish, although they looked modern, were they aliens, were they angels or were they gods? Because the feeling of them was all these different things. And that was when I started looking into the connections. Um, and if this was something to do with uh, a, a messenger angel or Gabriel, then he equates to Hermes, the messenger god of ancient Greece, who has heritage. Um, his mother is Maya. She's one of the seven sisters. Seven sisters are part they're the Ple the Pleiades they're the Pleiades so they're the uh, the seven sisters are the Pleiadians if you like um so Hermes is part of that heritage now that was just a, a simple connection I don't know how I missed it before but um having that experience it drew my attention to all these different things that they they might actually cross over with one another that's a really, yeah, I mean, that's really fascinating. Not something that I've come across before. Um, and what an experience as well. And I can't imagine what it must have felt like to be in that um, moment and experience such a, um, something that's so much bigger than ourselves. It must mm. have been um, ama amazing, but incredibly scary. I mean, we've got quite a few people in the chat room having the, kind of joining in the conversation. We have Andy Mercer. Who oh, hi, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he he's um, put some things in the chat room as well. Um, but he says it's stuff that you've you've discussed before. Um, he says um, these beings uh, do not have an objective external existence. They're part of the psychological framework that our consciousness adheres to. So that's that's where he's coming from in, in mm -hmm. his 
to uh, um, you know experiences. And he also says in very big capital letters, "Hello." <laughs> <laughs> um, we have Richard Clements as well in the in the um, chat room. He also says hello as well. And um, um, Paul Rook. So hi everyone. So if you've got any questions for um, Alison or anything that Alison has spoken about, you would like to discuss more, then please leave the questions in the chat room, and we can give them to Alison, and she can explore those a little bit more for you. But I think now would be a great point for us to have a quick break is that okay yeah that's fine by me you're listening to paris search uk radio news views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the uk and beyond Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and the World Wide Web, Parasearch UK Radio. Hello, join me, Paul Rook, every Tuesday at 9pm for the Trident Paranormal Show, with interviews, news, and reviews from this galaxy and beyond, only on Parasearch UK Radio. You're listening to Seventh Sanctum with Kerry Ann, only on Parasearch UK Radio. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us and joining us back after the break. Um, you're listening to Seventh Sanctum on Parasearch UK Radio, and I'm Kerry Ann, and I'm joined this evening with Kerry Greenaway and Alison Dunlop. Now, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us because it's an it's an insight into um, something that I've never experienced before. I don't know if I ever want to either, but you know, it's, it's it gives you an insight into something that you know I've never ever heard of before. Um. One thing I would like to come away a little bit from your personal experiences, um, I would love to know about your journey into your investigations and to what the place that you are now. Um, I know that the SPI um, is something mm-hmm. that's quite um, big within that. Could you tell us more about that, please? Sure. So SPI, Strange Phenomena Investigations, uh, was started back in 1979 by Malcolm Robinson. And he started it because, uh, well, he'd always had uh, the interest and had always been looking into this subject. Um, but it was primarily because of the um, Bob Taylor incident in Livingston. And what happened with Bob Taylor, I don't know if, if you know about uh, the, that. It's one of our major incidents in Scotland, um, a forestry worker who um, witnessed a UFO and uh, in in the woods, in uh, Detchmont Woods in Livingston, um, this large sort of roundish shaped UFO, it kept on um, sort of uh, uh, being solid and then you could see through it. Um, and then uh, two sort of balls with spikes on them came out of it and rushed forward and started um, pulling at him. Uh, you know, his trousers, uh, which actually had um, tears in them from from where it had, these things had done that. He passed out and he woke up um, quite dishevelled afterwards. And uh, that was um, actually a police incident as well. It's the first of its kind um, in Scotland anyway, uh, where the police have... Um, been investigating something it was down as an attack by unknown persons um and he wasn't the kind of man to uh, make up things according to those who knew him um and you can see more about that or read more about that on uh, youtube or or it's, there's quite a few various um depictions of it um, so that was when SPI started up. And then Malcolm left to go to England 
Um, I think that was in the late 90s, perhaps. I'd known him um, early 90s, mid to mid 90s. And uh, so he went off down to England. And SPI in Scotland kind of um, went by the wayside. And I had uh, left uh, ufology and the paranormal um, on a back burner, shall we say, for about 14 years. And then I started um, through experiences like the one that I just told you about, the Pleiadians, uh, being dragged back into it quite literally, um, been told to, you know, you know, give this message to people. Um, so this had sort of brought me back into investigation. And I spoke to Malcolm and I said, I would like to get back into this. Um, and to cut a long story short, he said, well, I give you my blessing to if you want to start up SPI again in Scotland. And that was how SPI Scotland came about. Um, since then, now I think that's maybe about four or five years ago, uh, we now have about eight or 900 members, something like that, on Facebook. Um, and we have regular events and, like you know, we have like a book club. Uh, we stopped over the winter, but um, it'll be coming back on. And um, that's just sort of meeting for coffee and having a chat about a particular subject. Um, and we do bi-monthly sky watches as well. Uh, and investigations, uh, but, but the, the, these other things are to do with educating people, you know, so going out and sky watches, you're not just looking for UFOs, you're looking to be able to distinguish between what um, you can't tell what, it, what is up there, or whether it's a satellite, or whether it's a plane, what a helicopter looks like. Um, so you're, you're wanting to, even like meteor showers and things like that, so we'll deliberately go out during a meteor shower, so that we can see the difference um, and that we know that, right, that's a meteor. Um, and we also obviously have the Scottish UFO and Paranormal Conference, which we uh, co-organise. Um, uh, so that's that's pretty much what SPI Scotland does. Okay, so you mentioned the um, conference, and you've got one coming up this year, haven't you? We do, yes. Um, this one uh, this year is in Falkirk, so right in the heart of UFO land, um, otherwise known as the Falkirk Triangle or the Bonnie Bridge Triangle. Uh, and that's on Saturday the 8th of July at 10 a.m. till uh, 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. And uh, it's only £10 for the entire day. There's about, I think, seven speakers uh, on all different topics of the, the paranormal um, and ufology. So there's something there for it. We try to make it that there's going to be something there for everyone, uh, you know, the, the, that will um, appeal to their uh, particular interests because... You know, some people are not at all interested in UFOs. Um, some people are not at all interested in uh, spirits or ghosts or things like that. So we try and make it as diverse as possible. And um, the, this will be our third year. And uh, we've had good audiences every every year so far. And um, they've been extremely successful. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one as well. Now, each, each year... Um, whether this will change in the future or not. But each year, myself, Malcolm and Ron all give a talk and we're the co-organisers. Um, and we have uh, four other speakers. Gary Gray, who's a medium. Uh, Trisha Robertson, who's been on ADX Files. Gary Gray will be on ADX Files next month, I think. Um, Trisha Robertson, who... Um, is the former vice president of the SSPR. She, she takes quite a scientific approach to. She's she's very much a numbers lady um, to the to the whole um, psychical research um, subject. Uh, Innes Smith, who is looking at how can I think his question is how can we believe anything paranormal. And I'm just, I'm remembering, I'm just, this is from memory because I'm not actually on the page to, to look at their 
precise uh, subjects. I can do that if you like. But um, and Andrew Hennessy is the other speaker, and he's going to be talking about a place called Gorebridge. Now, this is a place that I've been to, and I can tell you there is something about that place. And when I went there, I didn't even know about this background stuff that Andrew talks about and that he invested in other people. Um, I think John Gillies, I think, is somebody else who investigates Scorebridge. And there is something strange about the land there. It's creepy. It's, I don't know, I'd never felt anything like it before. I'd gone to do a hand fasting uh, at um, Borthwick Castle, which is in the area. And it, I was walking maybe about a mile from the bus stop to the castle. And it was just, it was too quiet. That was, I think, one of the main things. I couldn't hear even any birds. And it really unnerved me. There was just there was a feeling of being watched, um, and I just I just really didn't like it. I couldn't get there quick enough, and I couldn't get away quick enough. Um, although I didn't actually see anything, it was only it was just this feeling. Um, many years later, in fact, just last year, we went to the A seventy to the place where. Uh, Gary Woods and Colin Wright had their abduction experience. Um, I don't know if you know about this or if you want me to talk about it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I've never, I've not heard of it. So yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, so these two men were coming back from work. Um, and so they were coming back from Edinburgh quite late at night I think it was about 11 o'clock or something. And the journey to Turbrax, uh, which, you know, that's where they were going. At some point, when they got to Harper Rig Reservoir, they turned the corner and there was this large black object above the road. And Gary put his foot down and sped underneath it. And this... uh, like um, like sparks were coming off it from the from the edge of this UFO, um, and when they went underneath it, everything just went black. Uh, and then when they came out of that, they were like on the road. I think they were like on the opposite side of the road, swerving, um, and. They realize, you know, their seatbelts were undone. They're like, well, what's going on here? Um, when they got to their destination, they, as it turned out, had an hour and a half of missing time. Um, so 90 whole minutes that they could not account for. Uh, so because the, the, when they arrived, the people said, where have you been? And as far as they were concerned, apart from this, everything went black. Then it was like the next second they were swerving about on the other side of the road. But I think they were actually further along the road than they had been. Um, So we went out there last year with Gary Wood. And um, that was some experience to actually stand on the stretch of road uh, where this had happened. And I think... You know, he himself is not really... He's quite unnerved being there himself. Um, After that happened, they started having uh, dreams and and things like that, found marks in their body, and they had a a regression, which as a hypnotherapist, I don't particularly recommend. Um, it, you know, you, there's too many grey areas of uh, false memory syndrome and things like that to be reliable. But they both came out with the same under hypnosis of being taken aboard a craft um, and, and seeing uh, alien beings. And when Gary asked one of them what they wanted, the reply was sanctuary. Uh, he still doesn't know exactly what that means. Um, but that was his experience and it, as I say it was quite something else to stand on that stretch of road and hear him telling you know, us 
his um, experience of this. Uh, and as I was standing there listening to him, I suddenly became aware that, you know, it was quite, it was, well, we were in darkness. It was the middle of the night or it was about midnight or something. I was actually seeing the energy of the land. Now, this is something that I don't normally see until the earlier, until the, um, the 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 dawn starts to break, you know, till the light starts to come into uh, the sky um, and we go from darkness into light, then I will start to see the energy, the aura of trees and plants. Um but there in, in the darkness, I was actually seeing it. I was seeing it pulse off the landscape. I had no real idea of what I, I, I was looking at because it was too dark. I could see some trees and things like that, but I could see the energy pulsing all around me. And it was just, it was like nothing I had ever seen. And I didn't like the feeling that I had there. Um, I, once Gary had finished, I said to everyone, what I could see and only one other person had been standing there seeing the exact same thing um, his name is Mark, he's probably listening to this, he, he's a, an avid listener of ADX Files um, and so whatever uh, Mark and I were in tune with there was definitely uh, something now it was so cold uh Eventually, myself and a friend uh, retired back to one of the cars. Um, I always, in these invest, I mean, it's sort of partly investigation, partly skywatch, but I always attempt what we call CE5. And CE5 is human initiated contact. So you have close encounters of the first kind, second kind, third kind, fourth kind is abduction, um, and fifth kind is human initiated contact. And I always have a go. You never know if it'll work. Um, and so I I did this. I connected with, um, because I am able to now, um, in meditation, connect with that being the Pleiadian uh, that visited me that night and who told me to tell people about them. Uh, so I connected with him and he there was this sort of um, he looked very shocked said what are you doing there um, and didn't seem very happy that I was there um, now maybe other people would call this their guide their spirit guide or whatever um, but just prior to that there was this high pitched sound um and I I whispered during, you know, my meditation, what is that? And my friend said, oh, my God, can you hear that as well? I wondered what it was. And we had been, you know, is that inside the car or is that outside the car? Um, it's just a really weird high-pitched noise. Uh when we asked the others, no, they did not hear this. It was like a screeching high-pitched noise. No, they did not hear this. Um, I think I, I did listen to a tape shortly afterwards which said that um, during uh, when your energy rises through the chakras, I think particularly through the crown chakra and above, um there can be heard a high pitched noise. That was the first time I had ever heard that, so I really don't know much else about that. But um, certainly, uh, that being that I connected with was not happy that we were there, and we left shortly afterwards. We, you, you know, because we'll sometimes we'll stay until about five, six in the morning, um, but partly because it was so cold but to be honest I really didn't want to be there um, for very much longer. It was like right we've come, we've seen it now let's get the hell out of here Sounds like a very intense experience and I think <clears throat> with anything as as I mean, me and Kerry when we talk about uh, 
about investigations and what we do and we work very much with energy and sensing energy and the body is an, ama- is, is an amazing tool to be able to oh, yeah. pick that up and to be in that kind of um, situation where you pick that energy up it does make you feel very uncomfortable so I could only imagine that's just us working on an energy level within you know um, maybe if we go to a location that might have something that's not so great there or whatever but to have such a powerful experience as well I can I can imagine you wanted to leave quite quickly yeah oh definitely um I mean it's not afterwards you go wow that was really interesting I wonder what that meant but at the time when you're actually in the situation yeah. it's <laughs> It's really freaky, um, yeah. and and only the the bravest of people. In fact, the um, one of the bravest um, that I, accounts that I've heard will be on um, Saturday's ADX Files with Barry Fitzgerald, and he's again talking about the the landscape and the voice or the song of the landscape that we rarely listen to, uh, and and one of his experiences really. Uh, gave me the shivers I thought oh and you were sitting there and he was sitting there on his own and his his dog was growling at something but and watching something but not moving I'm like oh (laughs) it's just too creepy yeah I think I would have been back and he was outside his car as well I think I'd have been back inside my car with all the doors locked and uh, driving swiftly away um but yeah there's so there's a lot of very uh very weird places to um and Gorebridge uh, is certainly one of them and that, sorry I, I diverted away from talking about uh, Andrew Hennessy who's going to be talking about that area in particular uh, at the conference in July so um that's certainly that's certainly going to be a good uh, talk to come and listen to they all are of course they all are I'm going amazing. to be talking <laughs> I'm going to be talking about angels, so that's um, uh, that's my other primary uh, research, as well as demons as the subject of angels. So um, that's what my talk's going to be on. I've not quite decided exactly what I'm going to say yet, but I'm looking for as many different stories about how angels have helped or saved people. So if any listeners can get in touch with me at uh, spi scotland at gmail.com please do that uh, and i'll include them in that talk well yeah guys get in touch because uh alison will be able to use that in her research and also on her talk in the at the conference that's oh, you've blown our minds alison to be fair <laughs> a little bit karen <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I mean, th- there's more to Alison than what we've spoken about tonight. So Alison is a shaman, a researcher, a writer, hypnotherapist. The course, the radio presenter is what we've already spoken about. Um, the involvement with SPI Scotland, um, with the conferences as well that she hosts, demonologist and angelologist. I hope I've pronounced that properly. I would apologise. Yeah, if I yeah, that's um, fine. And as Alison has said, her lectures, uh, you know, you can find them on YouTube. Um, so Demons and Dark Places, Fairies and Aliens. Now, this is, do you know what? This is something that um, I actually find quite fascinating because over the year, well, I would say over the year, me and Kerry have been working together. Both come from different type, type of um ends of the spectrum so to speak so my my roots are very much in within the paranormal um and spiritualism and uh parapsychology it's really weird how they've kind of intertwined from where i started to where i am now whereas kerry's on the other end of the spectrum um and so sometimes the topics that we have kind of meet in one place so aliens and angels are a topic that we've spoken about and i can see here now fairies and aliens as well so i'd love to know more about that yeah, um, fairies and and aliens. There's there's a lot of crossovers there too. Um, people think again. You'll hear Barry Fitzgerald talking about this on Saturday. Um, fairies and aliens. There are a lot of crossovers there as well, and people think of them as these, you know, the small uh, winged nature spirits. Not everybody views fairies as such things um 
yes, perhaps they view them as nature spirits or, or nature energy or whatever. But um, uh, and then people view also alien uh, angels as um, pure light energy. So it's difficult to say what all these things are. But yeah, there are lots of things in fairy mythology and in alien mythology, abduction is only one of them. Uh, you know, so there's lots of legends of fairy abduction, taking people into another uh, point in space and time. Um, and obviously the same goes with uh, aliens. I'm trying to rack my brains now to think of all the different uh, things that the, the two have in common. I think being taken into the hillside that's or taken underground that yeah. that would be another common element. Yeah. Um, because you have the fairy rings, isn't it? Where if you step inside, then you are meant to have been taken to this another land, so to speak. Sorry, I'm yeah. really simplifying it. I know there's more to it than that. Um, so in a way, that's a crossover within itself, isn't it? In, in regards to, uh, like you said, abductions. Well, it's interesting that um, uh, you mentioned fairy rings because obviously fairy rings are um, mushrooms or toadstools or whatever. Um, and ingesting these things can bring about experience. Um, hallucinogens can um, take you to another world. They can take you to another world where you see these beings, um, where you see uh, it's like a key into another dimension and in that other dimension you can see uh, things like aliens and, and uh, flying saucers um, and, and all sorts of things so and in fact if you look at um, even the shape of some UFOs they are very mushroom like in shape so I don't you know there's maybe something going on there as well um, with that mythology um, and that's not to say that just because you call it mythology that these things are not based on fact I think that these things are based on fact they're based on experience um, so of course being careful how to how I, I word what you know fact um, but well what, I, what in my view when somebody does experience something it is, it is a fact it's real no matter what they have experienced it and it is something real. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to... Can you think of any other um, crossovers between fairies and, and aliens? Because there's quite a few, but they're not all coming to mind right now. Well, um, but thinking, well, as you were talking, I was actually thinking um, in more the portal way, of like when you said that, you know, people were, you know, taken away into like fairy mounds and stuff like that. And then I was thinking of like, the triangle that you was talking about in Scotland, uh, which is a ufology hotspot, um, and that's in- indicative, if that's the right word, of uh-huh. um, something that's known as a portal that is supposed to be, allegedly, around the entire globe, various places like um, the Bermuda Triangle and stuff like that. Um, and again, you've got that crossover between aliens and fairies. It's that portal of going from earthbound, as we know it, into a different realm and isn't there a changeling as well where the, there was a, a myth of um a fairy would take the baby and leave a replacement um that's right baby, yes you know that that's right thing. um so stolen that's, by the fairies that's right yeah and a lot of i mean i've, I've looked i've done a show recently on the Chuatha de Danan and how um, they were had, supposed to have had superpowers but their physical appearances were very much like the pleiadians you were talking about so there are quite a lot of, like you say, crossovers. And we found a lot of um, alien links in regard to... Uh, sometimes you feel like you're reaching a little bit for that link, but it was... I mean, one of the things that they're supposed to have came to Ireland with was a sword that um, shot out blue flames and it felt very lightsabery, very space agey. Do you know what I mean? When you when you oh. was looking at the story of it. And um, so, yeah, I think there is a crossover, but... Just while you were saying that, I was having a quick look. Um, and another thing that, uh, another couple of things is um, the paralyzing abductees. Um, and of, well, you mentioned changelings there. 
uh, but also abducting uh, women and impregnating them um, and abducting them again and removing the, the unborn baby out of the womb uh, or, you know, also abducting men for for uh, the same reasons. Um, and obviously, and that's in the... Um, that's similar to fairy myths as well, where um, women are abducted to uh, procreate with fairies. Yeah. So they're, they're they're in the baby stealing business, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's that's one thing. Um, yeah. And there's supposed to be a culture. I use that word really loosely, so I'm sorry if it's the wrong word. Of, um, <laughs> They, there's a thing they call the indigo children, which is supposed to be hybrid alien yes. humans at yes. the moment. Um, it's a very th- it's a thing, isn't it, at the moment? The indigo children, um, and you get that colour coming again. You do indeed. Uh huh. Yeah. The, so there's, um, I think there's indigo, rainbow, and crystal children, yeah. and these are all um, from various. Uh, um, generations of people um and i can't remember which one that i would fall under um because my generation would be more the the humans who come along um to with more of a warrior type spirit to make changes uh, in society um and then I, i've met several people that i would put under the category of indigo children who are wise beyond their years um, and um, they just have a completely different aura about them Uh, I mean one that I met was six years old and uh, uh, another uh, young lady is um, about 18 or 19 and uh, you know, you just, you can just uh, tell that there's a difference. I don't really know how else to say it. Yeah. You know, you can just tell they're um, something different. Still human. Yeah. Um, oh, but, yeah, these children are completely but human. A di- yeah, but a different type of human, a different type of seeing the world and uh, yeah. and resonating with the world and very in tune with it, very yeah. in tune with it. They have um, a very, um, they, they operate at a different energy vibration is how I have explained it before now. So um, yeah. everyone yeah. has a unique energy signature, but they're, they're operating on a completely unique energy signature that we don't really get as society as a yeah. norm and um they tend to be very free spirits um and unfortunately i think some of them are being classed um with labels um yeah when like asperger's or autism that's right, or, yeah, or adhd yeah. and stuff like that because um they're operating on a completely different vibration level and they're not fitting into the norms of society um, and yeah. so they're, they're being classed as problem children when they're not, they're just vibrating on a different energy vibration. And it, you know, it, it's marrying the two, I think. Uh-huh. Um, I'm not saying that these don't exist, but, you know, these um, conditions don't exist. So please don't get me wrong on this. But we're just talking in regards to indigo children and crystal children and, and, um, and uh, it's indigo just a children. Theory. It's just a theory of what, what yeah, could... Yeah, it's a theory. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Yeah. Things are changing so much and there's new things coming in all the time and, and people are looking at things differently these days because we can. We can look at different kinds of uh, experiences that are happening to people and look them look at them for what they are rather than, you know, how it was before we just being logic all the time. I'm not saying it's not yeah. logical, but you know, you see what I'm saying. Well, I think some experiences I mean there's different kinds of experiences. Some experiences are very physical. In nature, um, like, you know, people who are out driving their cars or, you know, they're outside at the time and they're wide awake. And then you've got other experiences where people have been asleep and wake into the experience um, and sleep paralysis is involved and things like that. Um, And, you know, I, I don't know how to, you know, differentiate between um 
what might be something that's psychological going on is um, I think is more like Andy Mercer's uh, take on it and mm-hmm. and then other people who might say no but I was wide awake I was in my car this UFO was there and it, it you know then the car halted and I was abducted and I remember it beginning middle and ends or whatever you know so um there's <sighs> There's different ways to look at it, you know, and it's it's very, very difficult to say exactly what's going on. Um, Part of it, and I'm only saying that this is part of it, I think, is a reaction, our reaction to um, what we what we see going on around us in society. And this, I think, is um, for me, the sort of shamanic side of it. So we pick up unconsciously all the time, all this information is going in our eyes. We, but we are maybe not registering it, but it's in there somewhere. Sometimes it comes out in dreams. Sometimes it comes out in precognition, visions and things like that. And sometimes it comes out in experiences. Um, one thing that uh, I started uh, having now, at the time I was, oh, I was in my early 20s. I was on dialysis at the time. And I started, um, I started having again feelings. It was um, clear, clear sentience, uh, precognitive of something that um, I was very afraid of happening in America, in New York. Um, so this would have been round about ninety five. And I remember talking to a friend about it and, and she said, what do you mean? And I said, I don't know. I said, but there's two places that I don't want to go to right now. Um, one's New York and one's Paris. I've got really strong feelings about that and I don't know where it's coming from. Um, but that's that's how I feel now. It also, at the same time, I had um, a, a dream that I woke, I woke into um seeing an angel but the the dream was a priest was walking towards me saying the lord's prayer um which for a start it struck me as very unusual because i'm not christian um so it's a very very christian very religious dream and as he got closer and closer he started changing into something very evil and um I, i woke up uh, not quite with a scream, but I woke up in a sort of a cold sweat, and um, where this priest had been was this angel standing, well, floating right in front of me, and just glided back into the corner of the room and disappeared. She, her, she or he, had her arms outstretched, um, but it was this glowing white light. So I'd went from good to evil to to good again, and I, you know, I I wasn't quite sure what that all meant until possibly many years. Well, that one with the angel, there's a possibility of what that might have been. But certainly, when I was in the flat, that um, I had the incubus experience on the fifteenth floor. I started having precognitive visions. Uh, of planes going into the other high rises because uh, I could look across the city and see other high rises so I was looking out the window one day and I, I would just like be seeing this plane go into it and then you know be thinking that's awful if that happened you know that would just be awful and then thinking why why am I thinking this why am I imagining this? And I'll just shake myself out of it because at that point I really I didn't think of it as I didn't know it to be a vision. Um, so things like that have happened to me quite a lot where um, I, I've just um, thought no more of it. Um, and, you know, it happened quite a few times. And then when I was sitting one day looking out the window, I just I saw this plane coming into my window and thinking, oh my God, I wouldn't stand a chance if a plane crashed in here. Now, three months later was when 9-11 happened. And when I saw it on the, the TV, I mean, it, it was just, it was the most horrendous 
terrible. It was just the most horrendous thing I had ever, ever seen. It was so awful, so tragic. Um, I, and I, I can remember that entire day coming back in the bus and having this feeling, this horrible, horrible feeling. And the bus stopped in the middle of the city centre. Um, and my friend, it stopped for a while. And then the bus driver said, I'm not going anywhere. Um, if you want to walk from here. My friend and I get out and we walked on the roads of the city centre because there were no cars. I thought it was like, what's happened? This is like the end of the world. We, we were told there was a bomb threat in Glasgow. That's what we were told. So we actually deliberately walked away from the buildings. So we walked in the middle of the road through the city centre and it wasn't till I got home that um, I turned on the TV and saw what had happened it was just it was i was just so shocked um that i you know from 1995 to feeling something about new york to having those i then sort of thought oh my god i that was that what i was seeing when i saw planes going into the high rise buildings was that it um and then uh, just the other year there i was sitting um, in the flat that I'm in just now, and windows are a very seem to be a very significant thing. Um, so I turned and I was I looked um, out the window and I saw this bullet shaped bomb coming in my window, um, and I thought, right, okay, here we go. So I tuned into it because I knew this could be significant. This could be something. Um, as I say, these things don't happen to me all the time. They're very sporadic. They're very random. They just, um, I don't choose when they happen. Um, and it can be quite a while between each experience. Um, so this bullet shaped bomb had come in um, my window. Um, and when I said it came in, it's like you're seeing it with your third eye. It's not, you know, it's not a physical thing that you're seeing. It's like in your, in your mind's eye, as it were. Um, and so I tuned into it and so I started to see like domes in a city, like bluish colours across the, the top of the city. Um, and I, I did what I shouldn't have done. I started putting my own thoughts into it. Uh, domed city, Rome. Oh, my God, is the Pope going to be assassinated? Um, and what what in actual fact is right in front of me is two pictures of Paris. One is the Eiffel Tower and one is the Sacré-Cœur, which uh, is, is a chapel in Paris, uh, and it's domed. Uh, and the next day was the, ta- the Paris attacks. Um, so that, that, from the 1995 feelings about New York and Paris... These seemed to be the two precognitions uh, that I, for whatever reason, and I don't know what reason, but these were the two, I mean, I suppose because they're very, very significant um, events in uh, our time, uh, you know, that I really hope human beings learn from. But uh, these uh, events, I, I don't know my I don't have any particular connection to them, perhaps except to tell people about something, you know, that, that might resonate with them. Um, that that was my two. Um, well, as far as the, the priest thing is concerned, I don't know if um, that might have had anything to do with... Um, what, was the, what was the recent film about the um, abuse within the priesthood? Now, I don't know if that, and that has all kind of come out over the last few years, that um, there has been a significant amount of um, child abuse within the priesthood. Um, So I guess priests, some priests, now this is not to say all priests, there's an awful lot of good priests out there and nobody's, I'm not saying any different, um, but the, you know, there there was especially in America there was something like a hundred something. What, what was the name of that film? I cannot remember now. Um, I don't. I can't remember. Can't film. remember it. Um, no, I'll I'll try and remember by the end of the show. Um, but I don't know whether that had anything to do with what I saw 
um, because there's no other reason that I would I can think of that I would have seen uh, in this dream that became angelic uh, this uh, priest going from good to evil um, and then waking out of that uh, terrified um, so I don't know if that's what that means but um, it's another possibility what what led me on to that string of <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, I was just going to say about that was what could be going on there is a possibility. Another theory is because you're quite um, awake and use your third eye quite often that you're actually connecting into the collective consciousness. And because these are being these events are quite planned and a lot of energy goes into them to get these kind of events to actually happen. Um, you're actually picking up on that vibration from the collective consciousness and that's why you're getting these precogs. But it could just be, a, that's a theory. It's a theory, guys. It, well, it's. I think actually Kev Baker said the very same and it's probably, li- you know, like something like that. You know, it, it might be. I Prior to hearing that, which sounds actually much more plausible, I thought perhaps I was picking up um, on my environment, mm. things that that um, as I said before, you know, unconsciously, mm-hmm. we we pro, you know we process a lot of things yeah. um, unconsciously, and perhaps I had picked up on something, um, and then many years later had picked up on something else, uh, and it sort of churned out as a, a vision. Um, I I don't know, but. On the other hand, it seems very weird that it was two particularly significant world events mm. um, that that I registered with, you know, the, the New York Sorry, and so Paris. Andy Mercer is actually saying it's the collective unconscious, not the collective yeah. conscious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is why we love Andy Mercer so oh, And much. that's why we love Andy Mercer. <laughs> <laughs> So we just have to re- restate that word. <laughs> we know what we meant, don't we, Alison and Kerry? <laughs> we yep. knew fine. So did the the listeners. They hadn't even trust Andy to pick up on it. What's he like? <laughs> <laughs> the, that film that I was thinking about. It's called Spotlight. Spotlight. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so we've come. We've, we've gone well over our hour slot. Um, <laughs> we have <laughs> can't just shut definitely... me up once you wind me up <laughs> no, no, no. we definitely have to do this again but I definitely. think um, we, we should call it a night really thank you so much Alison for all everything you've shared with us this evening um, we would love to share your event for you and everything you've got coming up so if you can send that information over to us and we'll put all that information on the Parasearch UK radio like page um, we would love to be able to attend. We want to do so much. I this hope week. you can. Oh, that would be great. Um, come, come. <laughs> we'll have to crash you know on your you floor, though, Alison. <laughs> you know you we, want we, to. We say that we're joking. <laughs> Sorry, I never heard what you said. So we'll have to crash on your floor. All right, okay. There's not much space. <laughs> We don't take up a lot of room. We'll just find a corner somewhere to go in. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're, taking our, uh, we're taking our sleeping bag all over this year, apparently. We are. We, we're just, like, inviting ourselves to all sorts of people's <laughs> homes to crash on their floor. <laughs> oh, that's right. No, but thank you so much. And we will definitely... Um, Oh, Andy says we'll have to have Alison speak at our conference as well. So I think Andy's got some amazing plans for you as well, Alison. But we we will share that on the um, Parasearch UK Radio like page. And also I think Andy has our website. I think we've got a website up and running, Andy or Paul. Um, so we'll put it on there as well, hopefully. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, Alison. It's been amazing. Thank you so much for inviting me. I've had a blast. That oh. was great talking to you both. Brilliant. Well, I want to say good night to Alison and good night to Kerry. Thank you for joining me on Seventh Sanctum, Kerry. Good night. Would thank you, you so much. Well, thank you for including me because this has been a fascinating um, interview. And thank you so much, Alison. Um, very, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night. So join us tomorrow, Friday, for the Great Paranormal Debate, which is at 8 p.m. 
And also that would be with myself and Paul Rook. And then at nine, you have Dark Knight Show, which is Kerry Greenaway and Mark Manley. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Bye. <laughs>